Good evening. We are Pearl Jam. We are from Seattle, Washington. So I guess that must mean we're home. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett! Fucking camera in the truck. now welcome to live on four legs a definitive live pearl jam podcast and today we are traveling way back in time to the age of 2018 when tom brady played for the patriots and we had a president in this country that taught us wonderful words like kafifi and hamburgers and this world was so much different in 2018 believe it or not and we're heading right back there to talk about a show in Pearl Jam's hometown of Seattle. It's part of our hometown series that we've been doing this whole entire year, and now since it's December, we're almost at the final point in this. This is going to be the second to last hometown series episode. So let's jump right in. Randy Sobel over here, John Farrar over there. Hello, hello. Hey. You joke about 2018 being a not that long ago, but it feels like a long time ago. We've been through a well, lot since then. Uh, yes, we, yes, as, as, right. Uh, I, I think personally and, uh, yeah. just as a, as a nation and people, yes, we have changed a whole hell of a lot. If you told 2018, John and Randy that, Oh, you'd be doing this Pearl Jam podcast. And also there would be a little bit of pandemic that would prevent Pearl Jam shows from happening. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. weirded out by that, but around this time, you know, we're, we're Matt. This is Matt and I that 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 had started this and really started at the Fenway shows. But we're starting to watch the live streams and know what's going on in these shows and kind of get a sense of all right, setless construction. All right, speeches. All right, what are they doing? within a show and how are they doing it? And we're getting the sense to kind of prepare for what we did on the podcast. But this show and these shows were huge. They were dubbed the home shows for a reason. They hadn't played at home in five years. And these shows were all fundraised for homelessness in Seattle. And I think that's always a theme that you go back to with this band in their hometown is that whether it's homelessness, whether it's addict youth, they're always raising money for something in Seattle to give back to the community. And we've done a lot of these shows now, at least one a month. So we've really done almost every era, almost every single Seattle show to know that they're always trying to look for ways to give back. And it would be one thing if they just like provided lip service to it or just wrote a check and and be done with it. But they actually do a very good job of integrating that into the show. Like Mm. it really feels like this show has a little extra meaning behind it. It's this is a special one. Yes. And look, they're going to bring it up a lot and they're going to be bring up the stories. And I think the stories are so important, even more important than the performances, because from the stories, you get the sense of why you get the sense of why they put some songs together. You get the sense of why Ed connects with people the way that he does. And and I think it's all stemming from the even flow story. And you have to think that if Ed isn't friendly 
with somebody that has a post-traumatic stress issue and is homeless, if he isn't friendly with that person, if he doesn't make friends with him, you don't have one of your most famous songs of all time, and you probably don't have a situation like this. It's kind of the salt of the earth kind of person that Ed is, that he can do stuff like that, and I think he sees... And there's going to be one moment in the show that's that's very ominous, and, and that leads to a lot of question marks and, and thinking like, okay, why did he say something like that? But it, it leads to believe that he has kind of been in those shoes before, and he kind of understands what it's like to not have a home. And I think we've heard the stories before that he would go to school, and they would say, hey, you haven't been studying, you haven't been doing your homework, and he'd pull out of his backpack, he'd pull out his electric bills and, and his gas bills and say, yeah, because I, had, I have to work overnight shifts at a gas station or at a hotel just to get by and just to pay for myself to, to, to live. So he's sort of been there. Yeah, I think and there's a couple of ones where he says, you know, could have been me, could have been me. That's, that's exactly what I'm getting at, right? Yeah. Right, and it's very subtle, but I think you know exactly where he's coming from. Yep. So 2018 is not, look, we don't have to go back and really talk about this year in full and talk about like, oh, okay, the, this is where the band was, but we all kind of know what's going on here. We know that this is really the final nail in the coffin of the Lightning Bolt era, and while we don't know that gigaton is really on the horizon. We had the hint when Cantonami came out, and I think that is enough to tell you that, okay, they're at least thinking about new music. It had been five years since they written a new record, but we weren't seeing it yet, and it had been the longest since we had seen it. Yeah, and they, they were working on it at this point. So we, did, you know, we didn't know that it wouldn't come out for another year and a half, and then a month after this, they wouldn't play a show for three years. But... Yeah, you you get the sense that like they're starting to wind down this era and like it's something new is on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah, I get that it's sense. Got, from the very beginning, this show has that air of like like I said before, this is a special night. They're in a great mood. These songs are great. And it's a ballpark show, you know, ever since Wrigley in twenty thirteen, you know in the back of their mind, like hometown ballpark show, hometown ballpark show. Right. And the fact that they were able to to pull it off and to get there and have it be the called the home shows, have it be built up like this. These were the event shows for that year. Oh yeah. And absolutely. I think for the home shows, especially because they had done Wrigley for two years, they, they did two yep. nights yep. in 2016. They did 2013. Anybody that went to those were probably like, okay, a little done with Wrigley if I'm going to travel anywhere. And then Fenway kind of the same thing. They did two in 2016. And I know a lot of people from the East Coast that said, you know what? Seattle is the destination spot. If you are to go see Pearl Jam anywhere, a lot of people, probably like 80 to 90% of massive Pearl Jam fans would say, before I die or before this band goes away, I need to see them in Seattle in their hometown because that's that's just what it is. These shows are special. There's an air of importance. There's an air that the band kind of knows that they have to be on top of their game and and make it special. And I think Ed does such a great job in this show of playing host to not just the band, the crowd, and and but to the people that have traveled far and wide to go see them. You see all the flags that are in the crowd at the, if you watch this show and say, this is what our city is and this is why we're proud of it. Yeah, there's definitely, it's got that feel of like, you're in their spot now. You're in their house now. Home shows, look, that's the marketing there. And, and I think we saw it so much in airports and, and all over the place. And I think that's when the the Mopop Museum put up the, the displays and put up their, their Pearl Jam exhibit, I think, in 2018 or 2017, maybe when they got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's when they started it. But I really started seeing people put it up around the time that everybody is going to these home shows. I think that that has to be a huge part of the travel commitment as well. Like, okay, I'm going to see all yeah. these really cool-ass Pearl Jam artifacts while I'm here as well. 
Yep. And obviously a lot of people that are traveling far and far and wide are going to do all the hot spots and go, you know, sit sit at the the piano bench where where they played Black for the first time at London Bridge Studio and there's always destination spots from whether it's the Off Ramp Cafe which is now El Corazon to the Showbox to the Moore Theater anywhere I think everybody that goes to Seattle wants to see all these Pearl Jam landmarks. And I think a lot of that is uh, just brought into this weekend as well. So why don't we hit right into it? And the way that they're going to start this show after five years of not being in Seattle, they're going to kick it off with Long Road. that the first three of this show are really really good long road amazing build amazing rise amazing surge power exhilarating cathartic moments for a lot of people and then that breather when they can kind of stop and, and the fans react to that they're feeding off of that energy too and then you have the little teaser at the end of long road where stone is playing the intro of release into release was a cool little factor there low light as well very 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 good very strong versions of this i will get to elderly woman in just a second but first three what do you think 100 percent agree i mean this is flawless you know ed's in a good mood on long road he goes off on a vocal run about midway through he just sounds like he's like trying to reach the heavens it's fantastic it'll bring chills on your arms and we we talk a lot about these seamless transitions like you get a setting forth into a not for you or you might get a waste or a priest into better man or a lucan into not for you or something but the seamless transition here from long road into release is just powerful i mean this is a powerhouse opening and i'm I'm with you it does not get much better than this long road into release into low light open and I'm not even going to stop you at the first three. I think this whole main set is nearly flawless. The way that it's put together, the way that it's played, the way that it's executed. This is one of the best shows that we've heard in a long time. I was floored by almost the whole thing. We'll get to something a little bit later, but not a better way to open a show, in my opinion. I have here, at least in the Long Road release, in that order... It has only been played two times in that oh. order. They, they did it once in, in Phoenix, and they did it at Safeco. And I, and I, I, I want to say at Fenway in 2016, they played release into Long Road. I'm now checking because the utilizations that you can do on livefootsteps.org is that there's a search bar, and through the search bar, you can put in a song, and then you can put in another song, as I'm doing right now, 
release and then Long Road. And then you can kind of look at where they are consecutively. So I'm gonna click this little consecutive button, hit submit, and then I'll see the three shows that release was played into Long Road consecutively. It was at the DCU Center, the Worcester Show in 2013, then Los Angeles 2013, one of those Los Angeles shows, and then, like I mentioned, Fenway Park. So it's only been played back to back five times. In the same show, those are the, that, that's it. Seven times it's, it's been played in the same show. They, they did yeah. it once in 95, once in 96. That's how you know you're getting something super special. That's how you know that they're putting every exhausted last effort into this being a, an unforgettable night. And yes, love everything about the first three. Small town, I was ready to go. I was ready to go after Low Light. Like the rise, the upbeat tempo, that sounded really good. Low Light had just a, such a good energy and, and pace to it. And I was ready to, to break into a quarter or your go. And Small Town came in and I don't think they needed it. That's a small criticism, but I don't think that was needed in order to get this show to where they needed it to be. That's a small criticism. See, and I, I disagree. I, that, and that's fine. But I, I, I was ready to go after Low Light. I had already been there. I think Small Town can be the go. And I know what you're talking about. You're talking about getting into like the punk rock set and doing that. But I think at a show like this, at a ballpark show, you need a big, it's just crowd moment after crowd moment. And you've got 60, 70,000 people here. You got to get them going early. And I thought Small Town was fantastic. You hear the crowd on it and it just keeps that energy going. I thought this was paced very well. And yeah, you're, you're going to get to that part that you're talking about. You, you just got to wait a little bit. It's coming totally get what you're saying there I, I i was just ready i was ready to go and maybe it's me I, I i feel like when these little kickoffs these little kind of slow burns i think the rule of three always comes in my mind and look i think small town would have worked perfect after do the evolution into throw your hatred down i thought that that would have been the place for it but that's okay and that's revisionist history and that's just a me thing and oh something that i enjoy on the bootleg and i like to put that out there for other people to kind of think about okay if i go to these shows why they're doing these things and what maybe you like as well because there's going to be certain things and certain aspects of shows that you out there are, are interested as well so you might love the small town that's tacked on at the end or maybe you like it in a different spot and that's that's why you bring these things up, but everybody has a good, strong, valid opinion about it, and none of them are wrong. This is where you get into the show, though. Corduroy, and then Go Evolution, but you're going to get some... Some of these, the navigation's going to be a little bit difficult on, because you're getting a lot of speeches in this, but you would naturally get Corduroy, Go, and Evolution all in a row here, but Corduroy happens, then you get a speech, and then you get the, the following two. So, Corduroy... I think it was great that Ed was just like, Mikey take over, and Mike just had some really nice sounding solos in Corduroy. Just the oh, first so, one just sounding so fluid and so melodic. Right, yeah, he's clean just, melodic. Oh, he's just feeling it completely. Right, and then the second solo was just, that was the stunner. That was the one where yeah. he was able to go off a little bit and really make you, that's that, there's the key phrase right there, make you feel like you're at a Pearl Jam show, but not just that. They're about to make you feel like you're home. We are Pearl Jam. We are from Seattle, Washington. So I guess that must mean we're home. It must mean that you're home. Yeah. Look at our beautiful home. What a, what a great night we have. We're so fortunate. Uh, Cheers. Uh, and to uh, any of you nice folks out there who might be from different places, I always recognize a few. Uh, welcome to the city, and we're so happy to have you. And, uh, and uh, you know, if the question is why I go home, it's, it's the answer is. Uh, Cause it's a beautiful fucking place. <laughs> uh, so here we are uh, 
you're participating in, in a, a, an event where we've, we're, we're taking care of some uh, big issues here. And about 28 years ago, we played not too far down the street. The first time uh, our first show was maybe seven or eight songs. And uh, back then, it only took about 30 minutes to kind of cover all the issues. But now we live in a much more complex time. Uh, it's gonna take a lot more than 30 minutes to uh, cover all the aspects of uh, modern day life. Um, so grateful to be here, so grateful for the use of this facility. And uh, it's nice to be out here in Centerfield. That's why they're there for. They're telling you right away, like, okay, we're here for a purpose. We're here in our hometown. They're connecting you to all these different stories. And this is just the first one to kind of whet the appetite and, and tell you, like, okay, Ed's got a lot to say tonight. And, and that's okay. There are some people that are going to like those Ed shows. And I think that this is a quintessential good Ed speech show. Because I understand when people say, like, okay, Ed could be talking too much. And you never know why. Because some some of it could just be because he feels like communicating with the crowd before an encore or something like that. Some, some of it, he's just had too much wine. He gets, sure. He gets talkative. Sure. And some of it is an equipment issue and Mike has to fix something or Jeff has to fix something and, and it just happens, but he does go off. I feel like every speech in the show was straight into the point, straight into the point and yeah. fun and connecting with him in the band. It might be one of his best speech written shows that they have in their whole entire catalog. There's so. a there's a funny moment too in this this first one where I think you had the feed that you're watching is like the thing that was shown on the screen at the yes. show. And it cuts to Jeff. And you know, you've seen those those memes or whatever, those things like find someone who looks at you yeah. like so and so looks at someone. Oh, yeah. The look that Jeff has when he's watching Ed talk is just like complete it's just, he's just in love. Like find someone who looks at you the way Jeff looks at Ed during the speech. And you know what? I think that has been done before, to be yeah. honest with you. And I, I, when I was watching that and I saw that I, that shot, I'm like, that that is a very familiar Jeff smile. Like him just oh, looking at Ed with joy. awe. Yeah. And just kind of an understanding like we're not here without all this. And the, the long road could, you know, from the beginning of the show could be uh, interpreted in so many different ways. But to really get to where they were in 2018 compared to what was going on in 1991 or, or yeah. 1990, I should say it was a long road to get there. Yeah, and but like, you, think about you it, they're, they're at home. They're playing for, this is probably the most people they played for in Seattle since drop in the park. I'm just pulled that out of the top of my head, but from all the other places they've been do not hold nearly this many. And I can't remember any other really outdoor shows like this, well, the feeling they must have on stage, but you know, you feel like you're flying. We mentioned a couple weeks ago, and this is going to come up in, in a later conversation, but we mentioned a couple weeks ago that they never wanted to play the Kingdom because the sound there was just crappy. That you'd sit sit in, in the upper deck and you would not be able to hear anything. And that's, you know, a lot of bands would take the money to just play in their hometown, to play wherever, to play the biggest spot, to have the place where you can sell the most merchandise. And the Kingdom was it, and the Kingdom was kind of in shambles by the time that that they would have been playing in like 95 96 whenever but they decided to choose quality over quantity in in that aspect and and uh, i think that they, they were right it was well worth that wait almost 20 years for that go evolution like we mentioned before that these kind of packaged together go gets a little bit of a false start and I don't know exactly what happened, but Ed isn't on mic. He's he's over hovering with Jeff, mentioning something to Jeff. But man, they explode right away and they kind of keep it going. And it doesn't feel like anybody's really that confused. So nothing really stops. And then we kind of get the stick tap to get back into it. And they go right back to, to where they were. And it's just a, an explosive version of this. I thought that this was an amazing way to get you kind of juiced up for the next little part of the set. Everything that happened beforehand can kind of be constructed as, as its own section. Now Go is really introducing you to just the meat of the main set here and such a great version, especially for, for one in 2018. Yeah, you wanted your cathartic punk rock song to jump up and release some pent up energy too. You got it with these two. 
Yup, uh, evolution, same same thing. Good momentum, and Jeff and Mike get their moment together doing the the communion, yep. and yep. they're just very tight already, very tight gelling in this show, and that, that that's going to be a theme for most of it. So, this is exactly look. I, I I didn't have to go far to to say this quote. I thought it was coming a little bit later, but Ed asks how everybody is on top. Nights like these, you don't miss the kingdom at all. The concrete gray lady was a bitch. She sounded like shit. Does it sound okay back there? Years ago, we met a great girl who's here tonight who we met down at the Bridge School shows. I was like, okay, Maricor's there. Yep, I didn't know that. Exactly. Yeah, I thought it was no. going to be her. Yep, yep I was waiting that's for the it. first thing. But I think he says, Drew, this one's for you. So I, I don't remember that name from doing all the bridge school shows that we did. And if you want to go back there, that, that's those, those are all on the Patreon, all 18 of those shows, 17. There's a little two second clip where they show off to the side. Yeah. It's a great segue to get you into a Neil Young song that hadn't been played in a while. And, and really this was brought back specifically for the stadium show. played 12 times and it's one of the more rare Neil ones that you get to hear and one that they wrote with the band and I I always love when Mike gets the Neil parts in this because we did a Neil Jam show from Ireland about over a year ago and you're able to hear that Neil's just going off on a lot of these songs and Mike is taking much of a back seat which look it's Neil Young you take a back seat in 1995 no questions asked but to hear versions of Throw Your Hatred Down where the band is able to go off on it and Mike gets to have his signature moments like this and take the Neil parts and make them his own, that's what I'm listening for there. I love this. Absolutely. This is one of my favorite songs on Mirrorball, which means it's one of my favorite songs. And yeah, Stone gets the first solo and he just crushes it. And then Mike just gets the next two and just completely rips it apart like this is your even flow moment right this is even though we're going to get even flow sure. later this is like the big guitar moment in the show you're, you're getting this eight songs in here and, and i mean it looked like ed was kind of looking down to get the lyrics which is which is fine but yeah I'm, I'm so glad they brought this back i wish they would do i'm the ocean i wish they would do song x more often but this is just one of my favorite songs. I'm so glad they brought it back. I think this is fantastic. And again, a great little curve here in the middle of the set. Like, you've kind of gone chalk early on. You, there's no really rare songs in that first set. And here you're getting like, oh, it's here's a request basically for the Bridge School, for Drew. You're getting something really rare here early on. So yeah, very cool. Yeah, and, and I think that Night 2 would be the rare show of the two. Yeah. And this one is more like very standard what Pearl Jam has in their arsenal and their best stuff. And I think I called it at the time and I remember trying to post in groups and trying to make conversation before doing the whole podcast thing and and kind of saying like this would be an all-star game type show where you invite the veterans, you invite some of the old timers that that have been around, you invite some of the new kids like like minor manners that need to get some experience and, and some exposure that are very good. And, yeah, it's, it's uh, a celebration. You, this is yeah. this is a celebration show. It's like the whole night has a feeling of like we made it here. All the speeches you've talked about, like every band member gets a moment. There's a lot of speeches, a lot of stuff we haven't heard before. This whole night has the feeling of like let's just celebrate Seattle and everything we've gone through. And it's it's just a special night. I mean, how many times do I need to say it? 
oh, it's going to come up at least five or six more times that, that yeah. yes, like these yeah. are going to be moments that are going to be remembered that are going to be special, of course. And now we're, we're kind of getting back into the set list a little bit here, and, and this is, again, where the navigation gets a little bit difficult, where Minor Manners is packaged with Throw Your Hatred Down, but they cut right after Minor Manners and right before Lightning Bolt given a fly, which all would be kind of in the same section at a normal show, but you're getting more speeches. Real quick, Mind Your Manners, I, I loved from this show. That's why I want to bring it up. It's been a while since I've really loved a version of Mind Your Manners, and I thought, I thought that they were just on for this. Matt, amazing backup vocals on it. I, I love yep, the backup that's what vocals. I wrote down as well. Yeah, Cameron's fantastic on this. I think a lot of times we'll talk about, you know, oh, this song had like a little surge to it. You've already, you know, you already talked about that with Long Road. Every song nearly has this in the show. Like they oh, yeah. are, this is one of the best overall feel Pearl Jam shows you could ever listen to. Like if you ever just want to hear them completely in their element, completely comfortable, just nailing every single song. These are all standout versions of all of these songs. Mind yeah. Manners included. Yeah, and I think that that's saying a lot when a song like Mind Your Manners is not a song that we'd ever do an evolution of because it just doesn't grow. It doesn't yeah. change. So you listen to one and it lasts for about two and a half minutes and then you listen to the next and you're like, okay, well, yep, that's essentially what they were doing on this tour. So, so to get the one that stands out, especially in that environment, that's important right there. That's a, that's a moment to me. Good stuff. But the guitars just jump out, out at you too. Just everything from this. And packaging kind of lightning bolt given a fly there as well, but in between Minor Matters Lightning Bolt, which is obviously the uh, the combo from the time period, Ed is mentioning that they're playing over in center field. Uh, I'm thinking about being out here in center field, and uh, uh, my favorite player was Ichiro. I think he played right over there last month. There was a guy that used to play out right here, number 44. He was a lesser known hero, but I think he had four home runs in, in one game. And his name was uh, Mike Cameron. But then the other, the other Seattle Mariner uh, who uh, made magic in, in, in this very space, and the old kingdom. Uh, and he's such a huge fan of music and, and a really good drummer, you see. And, uh, you know, he likes our group okay. Uh, and it's Randy Johnson, that's what I'm talking about. The big unit. How did he get that? Nick? But, uh, but his favorite band of all time was Soundgarden, is Soundgarden, will forever be Soundgarden. And, uh... So... Randy would be excited to know that tonight in center field is, is not Mike Cameron, but Mr. Matt Cameron on the drum kit. I'll just say this. A bad dad joke prevented Junior Griffey from being mentioned at this show, and that's that's a shame. That's a shame, because Griffey should have... Griffey yeah, should have gotten. I was waiting for the Griffey Jr. reference. Yeah. Center field, man. Center field. Yeah. I know Griffey really didn't play at Safeco. Probably they they probably moved to Safeco after they traded Griffey to Cincinnati. But come on, Griffey's the best Mariner of all time. You, you got to give a shout out to to Junior. Lightning Bolt, given a fly, like I mentioned before, great. And I think that it's after Lightning Bolt, and this is, again, where the navigation gets so choppy here, that Ed mentions a man from Laurelhurst, who happens to be the man to his right. He was, he was stuck in a room uh, with him and his guitar, and some Muddy Waters records, and some Stevie Ray Vaughan records. 
which is why one of the first songs he ever wrote was called Lowell Hurst Blues. But then he grew up. And then he went on to write things like this. get Matt's story, which really isn't Matt's story, it's more like Randy Johnson's story, and then you actually get a real Mike story here, and then that's going to kind of really kick off after giving a fly, you're getting another stop, and you're going to get a real good story on this one. This might be my favorite of all of the band member stories. I think this is the best. All right, on this next one, we have Capitol Hill's own, Capitol Hill's very own, Mr. Stone Gossett. Stone, who, uh, he was part of a gang called the, the Newton Street Boys. Uh, is it a gang or like a, is it more chess club? The badass, mean chess club. You didn't fuck with the Newton Street Boys. Nah. -uh. And, and he, uh, he worked at a bakery. Oh, by the way, Matt Cameron, now he worked at a Kinko's. Mike, you were at the pizza place. Uh, Stone was at a bakery in the Pioneer Square, right down in the middle of the... So when we first met him, he had made more dough than all of us put together. But thank God, because he... I know, well, fuck you. You think I've got notes on all this shit? I'm making it up. You ever seen the fucking president talk? Jesus Christ. I mean, I know I, it wasn't a great joke, my, the kind that my kids... Well, they don't like them, but they act like they do. And, uh, but I didn't think it was so bad to be, you know, presidential. But anyways, I'm glad that uh, however you made the dough or the money, whatever, but you, you got yourself some, a couple guitars and some amps, because Stone Gossard, you've changed my life, that's for sure. Thank you. Worst dad joke of all time by it, Ed. Bad reaction. It got a bad reaction. And, and Ed, yeah. Ed was not happy that it got a bad reaction. He's like, okay, fuck off, you guys. <laughs> oh, he, you I know tried. when he thought of that, he was like, oh, this is going to kill. <laughs> yeah, they say all musicians want to be stand-up comedians and all stand-up comedians want to be musicians. And right. Ed is living proof of that. Oh, yeah, uh, 100%. I think he revels in that fact. Absolutely. But, yeah, he's he kind of throws in a little jab there. He says, have you, have you guys seen the president talk? So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's he knows it's not it's not the greatest joke in the world, but that gets you into one of the all-time great Stone Gossard songs, "All Those Yesterdays." Don't you think you've got enough? Well, maybe. Yesterday's, if you didn't know, is the king of the trash, and I bring that up. That is a reference that maybe not a lot of people would get because that happened over a year ago, but those who know, know that doesn't mean the song is trash. That means we love the song, but 
Oh, go listen to the the, the, the trash version of Deprogrammed on our Patreon if you get the, uh, go the time. Go listen to the whole thing. Start start at the beginning and then work your way back in. Yeah. That would be that would be a good project if you had time over Christmas. Just good break holiday to do listening. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's worth it's worth the listen. I happen to really really love this song, and I've always really really loved the song. And I oh, don't yeah, think I, I I don't think I knew that I loved it until I started to take it seriously. And I think I've always kind of loved that melody, that kind of staggered melody. And remind, they always talk about how it reminds you of psychedelic Beatles. And we're going to start talking about the Beatles a lot in a little bit. So hang on to that thought. But just kind of creeps up on you because it's only been played 21 times. So you're not getting the full sense of what the song is, especially live. And and to know that they're bringing this to, to kind of give Stone, I'm sure Ed said to Stone before the show, like, hey, Stone, which which one do you want? Like, we, we got a couple that you can do. Which which one do you want? I'm sure he was like, OK, let's let's give this a try. And it, it, yeah. there, there's a lot you can pick from with Stone. But but this was a special one to him. And Stone's backups are awesome and mike solo was really good as well they, they've had a limited amount of time live with it but you gotta say bring it back just yeah. do it already the the fourth yield song out of the first 12 which is which tells you something as well that's right and the next night they would play brandon J within like the first three or four songs too so yeah uh, they're they're thinking about the record so this is going to be the story of the night and the reason why they're all here this little song called Even Flow was written because Ed befriended a man also named Ed. And, well, I'll just let a guy named Ed tell the story. This next song was written by uh, a guy I used to hang out with when our office was uh, started out in Pioneer Square. We were making the first record, and Jeff and I were spent a lot of time down there doing the artwork and checking the mixes and... and uh, and we were down there every day, and, and there was a guy that lived in one of the foyers, and then, and then in the, the, the middle of the day, he'd kind of take his grocery cart and hang out in the, in the, in the deal, and, and I would get him the same sandwich that I would get, and, and, and he just looked interesting, so we, we started having these, these hangout conversations, you know? And uh, his name was Eddie, and he was a, a, a large African-American man who, who kind of took to wearing like a blue tarp most of the time. And uh, some of you might even remember him. And he, he had a, go, uh, a shopping cart, um, but he always had a globe sticking out of it, you know. So we'd talk, and he was a Vietnam vet. So we'd spend time, and he'd kind of show me, you know, he'd have these good moments. and. and He'd tell me these stories about what he'd been through and, and some of the atrocities he had seen. And, and, uh, and, and, and then other days he, he wasn't there. And, and it was, I could see him fighting with his, with his mind and his own experiences. And, and he didn't, obviously wasn't getting help or the resources weren't there or he had been too far gone. Uh, we came back from European tour and after knowing him for about a year and a half, and, uh, and I couldn't find him anywhere. And, and I started asking around, asking around, and some of the other folks, and he was, he was under the viaduct, which was great, because I thought I lost my friend. And uh, so we had about a month more of hanging out, and then after the next tour, I came back, and, and that's when I, I had really lost him. Um, so uh, uh, the song was written be before he passed away, and uh, he never got to hear it, and uh, he never knew that, that, that he was part of it. And, um, so, and I've never really told that story about him in particular until tonight, because it's the issue that we're talking about. And I think one of the things that could be most important to do is, is just elevate the, the understanding and the empathy uh, uh, towards our, our homeless neighbors. Um, so this one's for Eddie. All that right there tells you all you need to know 
about why they're doing what they're doing in their hometown that night and how special it is that they are doing it. And it's really, it's, uh, you know, 28 years in the making at that point that, you know, from 1990, the minute that Ed moved there, like that is something that, you know, even when they didn't feel like they were in power, I'm sure in the back of their heads, they were thinking like, what can we do to, to stop this? What can we do to end homelessness, to, to get people the mental health help that they need? And it's the reason why they want to support the community. Again, befriending somebody like that, I think you and I probably go on our separate business when we see somebody like that on the street. I mean, I I worked and lived near New York City from, and seen so many people. You see people with signs. You see those people every single day. And sometimes you, you, you just walk right past them. And... You don't know what's going on there and these people need help and it's more serious than, you know, needing a couple bucks for, you know, a sandwich or something like that. They they need more help. They need medication. They need therapy and, you know, they're, they're homeless veterans that are out there too. And and in this situation that, 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 that's what this is, but it just goes so much deeper than what you think it is on the surface level. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to refrain from talking about, capitalism and how it's meant to just throw people to the curb literally this little speech is like i'm i agree with you it is it is the moment from this show and getting the story of how of like what even flow was about because you know we we know you know this the cover of the single is a hand like and i and i wonder now if that was meant to be this this eddie person like you know the cover of that single is the stark white with the door and the guy's kind of leaning on the the side of the steps just kind of sitting there and like we we knew that that's what the song was about but we didn't know that it was about a a specific person and that they had this kind of relationship and ed tells a story like we you know we just played it about coming back from tour and seeing him and then coming back from tour and he wasn't there and then going to find him and then he wasn't there and they they lost him and yeah he never got to hear the song and like this just I saw this song in a whole new light after this and the version that, that follows this. I mean, we, you know, the God, there's 800 something versions of even flow. Now this might be one of the best ones in a long time because you can just feel how kind of rejuvenated the song feels after this. And after the speech, the crowd's completely on board. The crowd's completely into it. They, I remember the first time I heard this, I was just taken aback. Like, I can't believe he's actually telling the story of how the song was written. And, it gives it another just another takes it to another level it's just powerful for so many different reasons now and it's kind of you know i'm like a lot of people you know you start to take the song for granted you hear it so many times that it starts to become kind of run of the mill and we complain like oh they don't play oh, it too, too fast and they don't play here, like they used to can but, i throw something but, at you right now yeah, i know you're yeah. i know you're on something right now but yeah. after listening to this version i vowed to myself to never call even flow a exactly. bathroom break song yeah. ever again I, ever that's what again I was, that's what I was getting to is like it makes you never want to take the song for granted again ever since hearing this like every time I listen to even flow it I, I do the same thing like I, I don't tune out I uh, like I'm with you absolutely 100% but I think this version is is one of the best one in that they played in maybe 20 25 years how can it not be after that speech and especially the crowd just picks up on it completely like he kind of like lets himself be vulnerable and tells a story and just pulls everyone in whatever they played after this was gonna feel like incredible but i mean i'll go and this is my number one moment from the show this might be my number one moment from this year it's one of the it's one of the top moments like in the 2000s there's so many that we talk about but just getting this story after all these years and just it just brings something extra to the song completely yeah it's it's a fantastic moment yeah and i think the the important thing to kind of mention there is that it's so much less about what you're hearing in the song and obviously all the time in even flow what are what are we going to get to we're going to get to the bike moment we're going to say all right what was the solo like what defined this song and in this version what defined the song was the story and like i can go into what mike's solo sounded like and that it was very soulful and kind of eased its way into the shredder territory, and uh, and I, I like that because it's like the story kind of developed over time, and and giving the mic to the crowd too had to feel exhilarating from that moment. Like that, just very very good. I, I think it all just kind of stems from 
from being vulnerable about this and and telling people like okay we're not we're not bullshitting you when we say that we care about these issues that we care about these people that we want our community to thrive and be better everything they're telling you here is straight from their heart and is real and if you thought at that moment like okay what does my couple bucks have to do uh, you know is it going to make a difference yeah it, it sure is they made 11 million dollars from these two shows it's going to make a difference so that's more important than any even flow solo it's more important than any chorus run and any yeah yeah never vote republican it's more important than all that so just keep that keep that in mind when thinking of this song going forward Okay, now we get to a relevant topic, and the relevant topic here is the Beatles. And during 2018, they were able to do this little combination twice. Once in, I believe, Prague. I think it's Prague, but they did it here as well. And it's Beatles' help into the deep, deep cut from Riot Act, Help, Help. When I was younger, so much younger than today never needed anybody's help in any way now those days are gone i'm not so self-assured how i find i change my mind
get back documentaries out there right now. And I think that a little bit later, because there's going to be a song that kind of connects within Get Back, but a little bit later, I think we can bring that up. But here, I, I would like to talk about Help Help, actually. This era in 2018 is is the reaction to, and, and really the only live reaction that we have to the Trump administration, which means a lot of the 2003 Riot Act era stuff is resurfacing. And you get a lot of the European tour stuff. They brought back songs like Green Disease and they brought back uh, All or None Once or Twice. They brought back a couple of those songs from that era to kind of just remind you that the same themes are relevant right now. And I think Help Help was interesting in that aspect why they brought it back because this is I always saw this as being a an anti-war or, or kind of looking at war from a propaganda point of view in this song uh, there, there's certain lines that you absolutely can see that in I think that they were just feeling a lot of the same negative energy that they were feeling in 2003 and and not only that but man help help is a damn good live song and a damn good ballpark live song this is one i don't know why they weren't thinking about it as much in 2003 but god does this just electrify more than you think it would and just a fantastic choice of deep cuts at this show and you know sometimes it's kind of random you 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 will get one that'll feel like oh like that's it's cool that it's rare and it's cool that they played it but it's kind of awkward right there but just the choice of deep cuts in the show. Throw Your Hatred Down, All Those Yesterdays, Help Help Here, a couple more later on. It all feels very connected and strung together very well. And I'll even say, I, you know, Help Into Help Help also ties in. Homelessness. Even close, ties in with, yeah, the homelessness. Absolutely. The whole, the whole reason for the show. That's kind of a tie. And I even think, like, Help would work as an intro to even flow if they wanted to keep doing it. But, yeah, Help Help is a deep cut. You... you sit any Pearl Jam fan down and get them to start naming songs. It's going to be a while before you get to help help. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I think it's, it's almost too bad that it has to have this kind of novelty thing around it for them to play it. It needs, you know, they have to kind of have it be this little shtick with the cover and, the, you know, the, the double name and everything. But, yeah, I'm with you. I think it's it's great. I wish they had played more often. I All the stuff from Riot Act, criminal and appreciated. But, yeah, it's, it's just the tie-in of, of getting him solo doing help after that even flow it just keeps that theme going. Like you just, you just feel it take on a whole new meaning. That's a good point you bring up there because you don't necessarily in either song really think about, you know, the subject matter of what is it that needs help per se. But I mean, it can be interpreted however you please. And, and it's here for a reason. And Ed is really smart to, to think about going to this back catalog. And I'm sure when they were playing in Prague or wherever they played it for the first time in, in Europe that, okay, maybe this is one we have to save for that moment. I'm sure that these set lists were in his mind for months for these two shows yeah. and perf- I think so. perfected to be perfected. So great choice. And, and I can't say enough. This is the second time that we've ever covered help help on the show, which means we have what 11 more chances. I think it's been done 13 times. Got to hit back on those 2003. I know. Got a lot, I know got a but, lot more to do. Okay. So you're winding down a little bit here. And I think after a deep cut, I think you need something to bring maybe some of the 10 era people back in and it's time, give it time for a sing along. Yeah. yeah, yeah, black black is perfect for that, and uh, love it to transition into the end of the set because you, you kind of know they're coming up on a little over an hour here, and you know that they don't have much time left in the main set, and and black is just taking up such a huge chunk of that because it just feels like it keeps going that they they just keep jamming on it. Mike's driving, and and that exhilaration they do it so well giving that some breathing room and letting that moment be the we belong together moment. And that's what you get here. Like it's just kind of the wind down. It allows the crowd to connect with it and react to it. And it's the beauty of the song and they do it absolutely perfectly here. There's a little improv too, that it does like, it's like listening for you. It's really, really good. I like when he kind of gives you these little, 
improvs in it. You really get to to hear like what he's thinking about. And I wonder could if that, that... Be, could that be part of his story? Because you know he was yeah. he was saying that he yeah. they went overseas and they came yeah. back and and how how would you think that he's looking for for his for his friend Eddie? Yeah, at, I was just gonna say I think it, this might have been directed you? at Eddie. Yeah, mm-hmm. this little because it's very quick. It's almost very it's very quiet, almost kind of hushed. But yeah, very very good little little improv from Ed. Before you get into setting forth on the Patreon porch to end your set, you're going to get another band member shout out here, and that would be to the Big Sky Man, Big Sandy Jeff Ament. I had pointing out to the signs saying that this one says, I had to get a divorce to see Pearl Jam, and on the back it says, now I have a better man. So Ed saying, positive change out there, congratulations. And this is Jeff's moment where he gets the mention. He came from uh, Big Sandy. He came from Big Sandy. Big Sandy is not his mom's nickname. It, it is a uh, big, it, it is a uh, very, it is a small town in Montana. Uh, it, it is, uh, you'd think it would have been called Little Sandy, uh, but, but he came here to the big city of Seattle in the mid 80s or something, early 80s, 80. And, uh, and he saw the Who at the Kingdom and, and the Clash. Uh, and he worked at a place uh, making coffee. He, he still can make a real badass coffee, a uh, place called Raison Debt. And, uh, and he met a guy working there called uh, Andy Wood, which is. A life changer. Um, but I was gonna play. Uh, I was gonna play this one for uh, the big sky of Montana. This, this is for. Setting forth, I was floored by. I thought that was excellent. Usually, I see this as being sort of your transitional song. And this stood on its own. It stood on its own feet. I, I thought I, this was remarkable. Just, I, I wish it wasn't a minute and a half long. I wish that they can extend yeah. it sometimes and yeah. keep it going because it's it's just really well written song. Yeah, it just goes back to like all the standout performances in this this set. Just amazing. And yeah, setting forth an example. This one again, it just feels like it has some extra power behind it. I'm not a huge fan of the fast major. That's just me, though. But, uh, you know, this was kind of felt like just, and I don't know, the song sometimes just loses me a little bit. Like the whole, I ain't no Democrat, I ain't no Republican. Like that gets you to a good part. And then, then the line, the only party I know is freedom. I just don't like that phrasing. I think it's just kind of a, for all that buildup to end on that is just kind of, eh, I take it or leave it that that that's my one i i do like the song that it's just a one little little thing that i i guess recently I, I just realized you know what the word freedom to me is is just i don't know i i have a complicated relationship with that word and how people use it freely but it's just a little cheesy in, in, in my eyes. But uh, yeah, the, the slow to fast is the one that I prefer when you kind of ease the easier way into it. But this like right after setting forth, you almost don't realize it for a second that that's what they're doing, Patreon. And this actually felt really close to what they did at the vaccine special with Ed yeah. and, and Klinghoffer and, and White Reaper. Yeah. That, that felt pretty close to that. This is one, too, that like they, they played it a few times in the 90s. And then it really took off on that 2003, 2004, like the political era of Pearl Jam. And then it it comes back in 2016, back again, ballpark shows. Again, another one that played at Safeco, played at Wrigley, played at Fenway. And, you know, Wrigley 2018 is the slow end of the fast one. You know, that's the one that you're referring to. I think that might have even been the only time that they did it that way. No, they um, did it at Fenway. Fenway 2018, and, they yeah, did it like the, the that. two of them, the two of them. It's another one that it's a part of the time. You know, you talk about the the Trump era. This is one that kind of like came back for that. I think. 
it, just remarking on that again, isn't it kind of crazy yeah. that we only got one tour year in the Trump era? Yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, imagine what 2020 would have been, especially if they that yep. that rumored October yep. leg. Uh, that that could have been something oh, really yeah. special, something really crazy. Oh, so. Yeah. Porch is closing your set, of course, because Porch is always closing your set. I think every single night the main set was closed by Porch in 2018, unless there was something different in a festival or something like that. But Porch was played every single show with this. And Ed is running all over the stage. The rest of the band is is doing this extended groove that that, that sounds excellent. Ed walking into the crowd and doing the, the barricade, making for a big moment and connecting with this crowd that has listened to him be vulnerable for a full hour and, and a half here. So, yeah, uh, that, another great version of Porch. What can you say about that? It's fantastic. There's a long, long barrier here, I should mention, too, between the stage and the crowd. He has to take a minute to go out and connect. But, yeah, he, it's just another great moment in the show. He goes out and connects people and like, gets up and, and does the thing. Like, yeah, it's, it's great. You, you get Porch every night in this, but it's always special, and it's you're going to get the two closers here you're, you're getting like the bookends it's, it's just a perfect way to end the set okay we are at the encore let's pause for station identification talk about a couple things and i want to start off with talking about patreon and um it, it was a crazy patron week because we had five new patrons and that doesn't normally happen so i'm gonna say this i'm gonna attribute that to one thing because we only did one thing on patreon last week and that is the debut of our brand new series which is is still in its rough draft by the way it's still not finalized and supposed to be on the main platforms at some point but hallucinogenic recipe is the show that that uh patrick and brian will talk about the bootleg trading days and they did a remarkable job in their first episode and i think they brought in a, a new crowd at least a couple of people i know that came in thanks to the new show so i just want to thank everybody that did join up in the last seven days so rick schneider first person on there thank you rick dan lear who i know is the one because he had commented on our Patreon that uh, I think on that episode that he said he joined it because he found us on Reddit. So thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Mason Weinrich, thank you, Mason, for joining this week. And Scott Oresco, all of them are bonus leg members. And a big thank you goes out to Michael Fleischer, who has joined the Horizon Leg tier. So that that that's awesome. not every day thank that you, you get a Horizon yeah. Leg member. That's great. That's a ten dollar tier. There we don't you know we're, we're look if people want to donate to that here we're we're more than thankful that they do but that is out of the goodness of 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 people's heart that they do do it and uh for 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 doing that michael please get in touch with us because you are going to get an episode at some point in the future you are going to get a horizon profile that we'll do for you that'll be on patreon so all those fun things are coming your way thank you to to you and all five of you that have uh have joined this train here that has just been running for the the last two three years that we've been doing in the show which is just just great we it just makes us want to do more content which this week we did and on monday we put out a brand new late night series episode on the bob dylan tribute show so it, that's a really important show just listen to it because it's very there's a lot of great talking points in there and you know a who's who of rock legends that pearl jam are rubbing elbows with and really it's ed and mike they're rubbing elbows with and and not and to boot it's one of the best vocal performances in ed's entire career of masters of war and i think you guys are pretty familiar with it so if you want to check out our version of that that's over at patreon patreon.com slash live on four legs or search for live on four legs on the patreon app let's get into one or two other things here that i want to bring up uh this is the time to do it and one of the things is on december 16th this is when our annual holiday party is happening and we're doing things a little bit differently this year while we did the gift exchange which was huge we got 76 people involved in the gift exchange was just awesome and i'm so thankful that so many people were interested last year it was a lot of people last year but to get that much more is 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 wonderful and i'm i'm excited to see everybody at the event but uh we're doing things a little bit differently last year we were able to have a house band we couldn't manage the house band this year so what we're doing is we're doing a little bit of an open mic 
And by that, I mean, it's not like, okay, show up and bring your guitar and play whatever you want. It's you're, we're doing a sign up and you should go to live on four legs.com to look at the sign up. And if you're interested, if you're an artist, if you're in a band, if you're just somebody that plays guitar on your couch and you want to play to some people, cause you never get to, those are the kind of people you guys should be signing up for this because we want to hear from those people. Not even just guitarists, but piano players and a bassoon player. Let's get a bassoonist in here, you know? Like, let's get people that really want to yeah. dig in and, and cover Pearl Jam. And and, and it's, 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 it's pretty much for Pearl Jam covers, but it, it, I, I like to say Pearl Jam universe. So if you want to go and do Temple of the Dog, if you want to do... Neil Young, if you want to do The Who, that's all related within the Pearl Jam universe. Don't go off and do like a, a um, oh God, what's, 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 what the, what the K pop band? I can't remember their names. BTS. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're not doing BTS on this night. Well, we'll, we'll plan another one for BTS. What I ask you to do if you are a performer, if you are an artist, uh, somebody that, that just wants to play, keep on the lookout for that. And um, I, we're, we're just looking forward to seeing how many people we can get. And again, you know, not just people that are in bands, but like anybody that is just knows how to play an instrument and says, oh, I can, I can play this song on guitar. Yeah, I'll, 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 ta- I'll take a shot at it. And I bet I've actually gone out and asked some people that I know don't necessarily do this kind of thing to perform because I want to hear them perform and uh, and not just them, but I, I want to hear you guys perform too. So that's what you want to do. Head on over to live on four legs.com. It should be on our homepage slide or somewhere. Just look for it. It'll say Christmas party sign up or open mic sign up, something like that. So uh, if that's something you're interested in open mic. That is on December 16th through zoom. Please get in touch with us if you want to come to this event. It's going to be so much fun. We've been doing it. This is our second year doing it now. Last year was great. Then we did the one over the summer, which was the debut of the website. And that one was great as well. We're just continuing that energy on with this. So hope to see you guys there. And please get in touch. Uh, again, we can't make the link public. So get in touch with us personally at live on four legs podcast at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media accounts. One last thing before we get into the set, though, uh, we have a Christmas ornament that's for sale. And we just want to promote that because uh, Jennifer Bickle was so nice enough to uh, to to make one for us and to uh, be willing to 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 take some pre orders and things. And um, I ordered one, and it's going to come pretty soon. And I want to put it on my tree. And when I put it on my tree, I'm going to show you guys how awesome it is. And it just looks beautiful. And look, I I know that. You know, most of you guys have Santa and and your your favorite football team and your college you went to on your tree. But do you have a mediocre Pearl Jam podcast on your tree? I think not. So this would be the one to get, I guess. How much are they? They're eleven dollars. They're eleven dollars because they're um, some of the money is going to us and some of the money is going to Jennifer as well, yeah. who's nice enough to yeah. to put in the labor on it. So it's an Etsy website, but what I recommend you doing is going to our Pearl, Pearl Jam podcast community group on Facebook and seeing the pin. Or again, I gave you the information to get in touch with. Get in touch with us, and I will send you a link to purchase this. No problem at all. Uh, I think you can even search it on Etsy. You just search for live on four legs on Etsy. It should come up. So that's not going to be around forever. Make sure you get to that now because shipping is going to be a nightmare this year. It always is around the holidays. So just wanted to get that out there before we go into a massive encore because here we are back to the rock. Ed says we were back there discussing what songs we want to play. And I'm like a waiter with too many tables. I just want to make everyone happy. A lot of young kids in the audience on shoulders. And if kids are happy and safe, that's a really good barometer. And that's going to be the theme here is children and teachers and what teachers mean to better the lives of everybody. So as parents, we know that there's one part of the community um, and and one job in particular that uh, doesn't deserve the, the, the... it deserves so much more notoriety than they receive. Um, there are those who teach our children and teach them well. Um, 
And we've had the opportunity and we've been very blessed to have some teachers that, that have changed our kids' lives. And I know, because Kurt Vonnegut, I met Kurt Vonnegut uh, years ago in Seattle, many, many years ago. And that night when he spoke, he asked everybody in the crowd that had one teacher that completely changed their life. If, if that, that changed their life and put them on a, on a path that they still follow to this day and they still thought about what that teacher taught them. Um, he asked everybody in the crowd to, to raise their hand if you had that one teacher. So I'm gonna ask you tonight, if you had one teacher that changed your life, Up top, can I see you? See, it's just about every fucking body. That's how important it is. And we have two special teachers uh, that my kids brought tonight, and I wanted to allow them some notoriety and some applause and some recognition from all you, their fine group of neighbors here in Seattle. Uh, and I'd like to play this for them and borrow it from my friend Jack. Fall is here, nearly hell. Back to school and ring the bell. Brand new shoes and walking boots. Climb the fence, books and pens. I can tell that we are gonna be friends. I can tell that we are going to be friends Walk with me, I'll show lovely Through the park, by the tree we will be This was a nice speech. This was a very nice speech and one that, that hits home. I, I think, you know, I, I've had a teacher that had made a very big impact on my life. Have you had a teacher that you felt I, yeah, that way about? I, I, I couldn't think of one. Okay. Yeah, enough, yeah it, it's... You know, I, I, I'm I'm not somebody that went through school enjoying school, but I had a professor and um, my college radio station. He was the the director of the college radio station, and he took me under his wing. And I never had anybody take that much interest in what I was doing and saw that what I did had value in it and wanted me to be better and instilled that confidence in me. So yeah, that's um, just a big shout out because it was his uh, his birthday about a week ago. I think about him almost every day. Uh, Professor Bob Stern, uh, he, he passed about six years ago. So uh, it's just just one for him. He'd be very happy. I give him a shout. He probably he probably <laughs> tell me he doesn't want to be involved. He'd probably tell me not to not to mention him at all. That he, he wasn't responsible for any of it that it was all me that did it but uh he was extremely responsible for me doing what i'm doing right now so big shout out i have to give it to 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 bob there this is right here a cover they never done and it's really ed but it's a cover that has never been played on a pearl jam stage before it seems like one of the least likely covers you would ever hear at a pearl jam show wouldn't you think yeah that's fair Especially you when you, it, you only got it at these two, and that was it. Right. Especially I can't when you see think it ever of, coming back for anything else. Probably not. Probably not. This this and missing are really paired up because they did it at both of those shows for sure, and I, I don't see either of them coming back. But yeah, I, I, it, it's hard to even think of like a Jack White or a White Stripe song that that, that would kind of correlate to Pearl Jam. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, this, this was nice, and to see. Ed's daughters come out onto the stage with their teachers and, and dancing together and having a moment with one another. It was a really nice moment. And, and I think that seeing kids up there with their teacher on stage and, and knowing and, and look like they're in a spot where these kids could be homeschooled if they really wanted to be. And I'm sure they're not. And I'm sure they put him in school for a reason. And and I'm sure they go to the best schools because I think that's important for Ed. And I'm sure it's important for Jill, too. So uh, to see that, I, I think it was a nice way to give recognition to a, a, a job that is severely underpaid, severely understaffed, and severely underappreciated. Yeah, this was, I remember this, 
you know, obviously it wasn't that long ago, but I remember seeing this and kind of being taken aback, like, oh, those are his kids. Like, they're on stage with them. Yeah. And Might you kind of like that, that happened, right? Yeah. You kind of like, because they were so, you know, you worry about them being exploited and you want to keep them sheltered. But at this point, they're teenagers. Like, and we, at Ohana, we had Olivia came out and, was it Olivia or Harper? I don't remember. It was Olivia. I think, yeah. I think Harper got to sing with him too, but Olivia yeah, is the in, one that sings yeah. uh, My Father's Daughter. Yeah. That's right. Has a song on the, the soundtrack, Flag the Flag Day soundtrack, and came out and sang. And, yeah, it's like they're becoming their own people now. And, like, for a while it was like you never saw that. Like, because the level of fame and everything and, like, yeah, you, you don't want to expose your kids. To, you don't want to bring them out on stage because everyone's going to take pictures of them and the pictures going to be everywhere and everyone's going to be critiquing them. And, yeah, we know how that goes. But there they are. And they're out there with the teachers. And, like, yeah, it's it's a, it's a really cute, like, sweet moment. And it didn't feel weird. It didn't feel forced. Like, it felt like they wanted to be there with their teachers. So, yeah, it, I just remember kind of being taken aback by it. Like, oh, this is, this is a new era that we're in now. This is, this is different. They're not little kids anymore. Right. And going back to the whole idea of it being a hometown show yeah. and yeah. being a home show and that they can invite their teachers and it's not like they're sending their teachers out to Chicago or anything like that. It's like, okay, you're being recognized on a huge stage in probably the state you grew up in. I don't want to make any assumptions, but probably the state that you grew up in and the city that most closely relate to. The symmetry of Long Road opening, and we know that that's for Ed's teacher from, yes, from correct. San Diego, Clayton Liggett, and like you're getting another that here. I don't think that's accidental that that opened the show. No, like you mentioned before, I think this this set was meticulously thought yeah. about for months, and uh, I think that yes, you're you're absolutely right. There is a connection there, but we're going to be friends. I think that closes that chapter because we did the Wrigley show, we've done this, and I think we get to say goodbye to this song unless uh, there is another teacher moment coming up sometime in the future. But I think we get to say goodbye to that now. The next two. Nothing As It Seems and Let Me Sleep, you get a couple of deeper ones. I thought Mike killed the solo on Nothing As It Seems, and it really just builds beautifully into the final chorus. thought that was great. And even this was more of a faster version than more traditional versions, which I, I prefer to be more downtrodden. But the show isn't really about that. And honestly, like, it, it, did you think it was a weird one to follow up that cute moment? You know, like, wouldn't you think, like, Okay, get into a love song, get into like Just Breathe or something. Maybe, but again, I think it works. They kind of wanted to let that moment be what it was and then kind of change pace a little bit. And Right. Yeah, I think I think it works well. It, 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 originally, you're kind of like, oh, cool. But then, you know, as soon as, as soon as Mike kicks in, you're you're back in the moment and you're back in it. Yeah, I thought, thought it was great, a great transition. And then we have one that's pretty relevant around this time of year. Uh, we're in December now, so Let Me Sleep is going to be a song that a lot of people listen to in in December around Christmas time. So before this, it, it, really quick, Ed says, this is something we wrote a long time ago. It's something where you just wrote about what you know. And I believe he told the story at the Ohana show that he saw somebody homeless outside walking around before the show or, or wherever it was and, and I don't have the exact quote on that but I think it yeah, was something around Wrigley that too, I think yeah right at Wrigley. I think the Wrigley one was about himself like waiting for a subway and sitting yeah, yeah. there and having kind of no destination and nowhere to go so I yeah that that ties into the whole thing. I know it's 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 August and I kind of can gripe that like okay why would you play the song anytime that's not December like it it doesn't make sense. But they don't play shows in December, so yeah. you really got that the one time. But five years later it's 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 being brought back. We did that a month ago when we did Key Arena, but five years later you, you, the song comes back in their hometown. I think there is a cool tie into it. Yeah, and it was brought back just a couple of months ago. So, yeah, it's, it, the song lives on. Boy, when you think of Seattle songs, you got to think of these two that are coming up. And I know, look, I'm going out of order. I don't usually do this. In this instance, I can't not put breath and state of love and trust in the same sentence. I can't not do that. It's really the set list is breath. Then again today with Brandy Carlisle and then State of Love and Trust. But I have to give Brandy 
more of a spotlight. So I'm putting the single songs together because it's another tribute to the area. It's another tribute to Seattle. It's another tribute to early Pearl Jam that these two are kind of being played in the same area in this. I, I thought both were very good. I thought Breath was... It took a little bit of time to get going. I, I like kind of when the song is fresh and feels bouncy, but it, it took some time before it got there. And Say to Love and Trust has a little bit more pop to it, even though it had a very tiny mic guitar flub that you notice a little bit, but overall pretty rocking version. But single song, almost back to back in Seattle, never not going to be notable. Yeah, Breath. And I'm with you. Breath is A+. Plus. Especially Let Me Sleep Into Breath. That's like, you're going back to 1990 there so yeah, yeah right nice, nice little <laughs> not even nice 91 little, yeah so nice little moment there uh, i love it when they're paired together it's like they they go together perfectly i'm immediately 15 years old listen to that single soundtrack again on repeat in the middle of these two introducing for the first time at a pearl jam show is an incredible artist a good friend of mike and a favorite of barack obama brandy carlisle and she's a hometown girl too she's from washington as well like when you when you think of the artists that Pearl Jam have gone the bat for in like 2003 and like Slater Kenny comes to mind and in 2006 Kings of Leon and My Morning Jacket come to mind the only real one from this era that comes to mind because they didn't have an opener for years and years and years so it's not yeah, like they're yeah. putting emphasis on like go listen to this band and bringing out guys to, to, to come play with them and stuff like that but Brandy has been the consistent one and really by consistent I mean she played in Seattle and then played a couple of times in Ohana but they, they've done stuff together they did the Soundgarden reunion they did the Chris Cornell show as well so she's tied into this and it feels like Pearl Jam has brought her into this universe and, and my wife listens to her my wife likes her and I didn't really think one way or the other about her music or you yeah, know I never really yeah, I never really listen to her ever not not before pearl jam but i yeah. I, I dig her now oh I, okay. we'll put her on we'll put her on sometimes and i'm like yeah this is this is good but i would never even consider somebody like her before being talked about and and uh and befriending pearl jam it almost reminds me of kind of like the relationship they had with like ben harper back in like the late 90s yeah. or something on that yeah, kind I can of think level. That. yeah 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 yeah, she, this is great. I mean, I like he says, you know, they covered the song on the the tribute thing that they did for her, and it's a great song. Again, I'm I'm still not that familiar with her music, but this, she's this is gotta... completely different. Uh, she wrote this song completely differently. If if you listen yeah, to yeah. the two songs, they sound yeah. I think nothing, I heard a little bit like. of the original. Yeah, it didn't didn't sound the same, but she's got a powerful stage presence. Like she absolutely can hold her own with Ed, which not many people can do. And yeah, I mean, you know, future future Soundgarden lead singer Brandy Carlisle is the way we Love probably it. have to refer to her. Let's let's make it happen. I'm there. Yeah, call it New Dragons, right? Get some new music going. Like, yeah. Take my right. money. I'm in. The most disappointing part of this is that Ed didn't give her a lead line. 
she kind of just sang back up on it. And I think yeah, that it's almost it's almost too bad that they that they won't do Hunger Strike anymore because I would like to hear her uh, Hunger Strike. Yeah. If anybody was to do it, yeah. that's she's the one. And I don't know if if she's being groomed for it, but I think she spoke about it publicly and she's been like, Yeah, it, whenever they say yes, I'll be on board. So Absolutely. Again, this is this is a little out of order. Again, today happens before State of Love and Trust, which would happen before Rear View Mirror, but we kind of went out of order. But Rear View Mirror is closing your first encore here, and there's no surprises here. This is pretty driving atmospheric, a little bit spacey, but, but just powerful. And Ed's face when he's strumming is just a great sight. He just, you can tell he's into this. He's intense. Yeah. very intense. And then Matt turns loose a little bit at the end, and that was a nice moment. Everybody, they're doing a little bit of yeah, yeah, and you don't get call and responses on River River very often, and just a good way to rip into the back end of that song and to finish up your first encore. I can't think of any better way to, to do that. And they, they, you know, strangely enough, they don't usually do River Mirror on back to back nights, but I believe they did it night two as well. Yeah, to that. I mean, it's just one of those songs that just keeps growing and growing. We did kind of the the evolution episode on it, and you know, we always say there's not a bad version of it. And the way they they can play it differently back to back nights, so yeah, it makes perfect sense. You no know, two versions are alike. And I can't move on from this conversation without mentioning Mike down on his knees during that that ending burst oh, and yeah. just playing a portion to the crowd that's passionately singing along with him. And he, he, it looks like from the angle that it's at, that Mike is literally ripping the strings off his guitar. That's how hard he's going on that. So, yeah, they're feeling that, and uh, they're feeling pretty good going into encore number two, which is going to start out with, look, <laughs> you got to wait until encore two to get an introduction to the man with the big hands from Hawaii, but he's going to get one here. Yes, he's not from Seattle, so it doesn't fit in with that narrative, but everybody gets their own little piece. And even Ed gives yep. himself yep. the credit a little bit, too. You know someone we haven't introduced yet? He grew up in a small town in Hawaii. Mr. Boom Gasper! He's a big man with big hands. Big heart. And he's, he's been in our group for 18 years now, and he's still the new guy. <laughs> Let's hear it one more time for Boom. Brother Boom. And then there was a, a kid from San Diego who, who moved here when he was 25, and... Uh, and now he's lived here over half his life. And, and um, obviously, I'm not going anywhere. I like it here. And, uh, you know, there's a bit of magic that happened uh, in, a, in a, fair, a relatively short amount of time. And that is that uh, a coalition of volunteers and organizers, businesses and government, we all got together and, and got them together and they started having conversations and started elevating the discussion and the empathy became action and in a very short amount of time because they were incredibly good-minded people uh, and with your help supporting this endeavor we were able to raise $11 million as a starting point to eradicate what is a complex issue. And it's a complex issue. Uh, and what happens when it's not easy is that when you make some progress, it makes it even more fulfilling and more exciting. And more important that when you get the momentum, as we have now, to keep it rolling. And so what we ask of you is nothing more than what you are already going to do, which is vote. Yeah. 
but hold the people that you're voting for accountable because there are good people out there and they want to have discussions and they want to be part of a plan especially when they know that this city of Seattle could prove to the rest of the nation that it could happen here and it could happen anywhere and we can eradicate this problem of homeless neighbors in our city when we're as profitable as we've ever been we can beat this and we can do it together and we need your help and it's a wave and all of us are the water Wasted, a life wasted I'm never going back again Haven't tasted a life wasted I'm never going back again I escaped it a life wasted I'm never going back again At the end, very ominously, you said it, I think before the show started, uh, you said it could have been me. And that kind of takes you into a wasted reprise in the better man. That's very, very powerful. And, and like that, just hearing that part, I think I would have to take a double take. If, if I heard that correctly in the ballpark, I'd be like, what did you say? What? What? And that kind of like, gets a lot of thought processes in your head right there. Yeah, it's just another thing where he's letting you in. He's he's being vulnerable and he's not holding anything back at the they're completely comfortable at these shows. It's and again it ties in with that theme of like he's he's saying it could have been me, like I could have been Eddie. I could have been the homeless guy who who didn't make it, you know. He's just taking that moment to be thankful for where he came from and where he is and you know, you had the moment with his kids on stage and you gotta imagine like what's going through his head at that point, like from everything that we know from this whole story that's been told in public throughout these 28 at this point years to have a moment like that to just to just to think back and just be amazed at, at where you are yeah it's, all that stuff's going through his head i i believe at that point yeah and, and it really feels like sitting here you kind of think is there anything about him we don't know at this point it oh, feels sure. like he's yeah. he spilled everything you know it feels like you're so closely connected and that's a lot of the lore of talking about this and a lot of the lore of listening to these bootlegs is that you get to know these people, especially Ed, you get to kind of know them as, as, as well as you know family members, you know, telling stories that it feels like some of the stories sometimes that he repeats over and over and over again. If you've been to the cities where something very specific happened in that city and he ta- tells the story, that's like your uncle at Thanksgiving that continues to tell that one story that you're like, yeah, we heard this one before, but he can't help but finish it it feels like they're that kind of close-knit to to you so you never think about it in that aspect but very cool and 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 obviously there's there's probably tons of shit that we we don't know about all of them and maybe some some stuff that we don't want to know but this whole entire show connects you with them much more than it ever had prior Better Man is great. Uh, all the elements that make it a spectacle are absolutely there. The save it for later tag with a great call and response, a little extra improv on some of the don't runaways. It's the definitive of the type of song that you get to end these shows. Anthemic favorites, and all of these are anthem type songs. And Better Man is just the, the one to, to introduce you to what the end of the show is going to be. We had the sign earlier that was like, you know, now I have a better man. You thought they were going to play it then, but, you know, I'm glad it got played at this show. It's a big moment. And another another perfect spot where you need to sing along. Yep, absolutely. And that is going to get you into Comfortably Numb, which I'm going to guess we're not going to talk about a whole lot because I know your feelings about it. I don't have a whole lot on it because 
anytime they do comfortably numb, it pretty much comes off the same way it would come off in the last version you would do it. But it's a good, what I will say about it, it's a good ballpark atmospheric sort of song. But as for the choice, a little tired. Yeah, it just doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, I, I, and I, maybe yeah. maybe that opinion has rubbed off on me a little bit, uh, but you're right, it doesn't serve much of a purpose outside of like, okay, this is them connecting with classic rock, which they're about to do anyway in these two songs. There there are seven covers at this show, if anybody was keeping yeah. count, and it's not, that's not a big deal because you don't really think about it until now. The, the covers that they do, there's one that's really rare, there's one that doesn't get played a whole lot. There's one that has a guest star. And then these are pretty much your common covers at the end here. So there would be complaints from people. But I think when you have this many songs in the set, I don't think you have really much to complain about, especially when you're at this point and you know this is going to be the end of the night. You know the type of songs that you get at the end of the night is going to be these types of songs. So ending your night is big. Alive. I've got a feeling, which we'll get to, Rocket in the Free World, Yellow Led Better. And especially at the end of all this, you have to be saying, how the hell can they top this to play two days later, to play on the 10th, which they did top it, because that is that is a, a more of a spectacle kind of show and, a, and more of a rare show. And, and you know, they, they do stuff like Rats at that show and, and Bram J and other songs. But there's there's a lot going on there. And it's like a 35, 36 song set. And it's very, very memorable. But even when you're sitting here at this point, you're like, how do, how do they top something like this? Especially with all the stories being told. Yeah, I mean, that it, like that show kind of gets the recognition. But yeah, this show just as good. And this ending is, on paper, it looks kind of, kind of chalk and kind of like, you know, vanilla. But it is anything but. I'll talk about the Beatles. Let's do it. We've gotten here. We've kind of teased it a little bit throughout the show. So I, I wanted to wait till I got a feeling and, and not bring it up during help because I didn't want to not talk about help, help. I, I didn't want to bury a lead on that. But I've got a feeling is important because it's part of this Get Back documentary that that's out there. And if you haven't watched it yet, I'm sure it's on your to-do list. I know not everybody's a Beatles person, but I think it's very important from just a history of music standpoint and John you're not the biggest Beatles person in the world but but you're you're into this now too Beatles is one of those things where like I I have you know the I know the famous songs but I've never really I can't think of a time when I've actually sat down and listened to a Beatles album front to back Got it. you know it's just but you know god they've written probably 20 of the best 50 songs in history so yeah I'm definitely right. aware Right. And it's, it's hard not to be. And, and this whole documentary is the prelude to what would be uh, let it be sessions, which, which came out as, as a documentary after the Beatles broke up, which really showed kind of the, the final straw uh, the, that broke the camels back in the Beatles. And, and there's a lot of infighting with John and Paul in that, in that movie. And uh, you see a lot of the relationship with, with John and Yoko play out. And um, a, a lot of what this focuses on, without spoiling a lot, is just how the band is now so dominated by Paul McCartney and how he's written essentially everything. And John is kind of taking a backseat. Uh, like I mentioned well, him. Yeah, he was on heroin at the time. R- right, right. He's stoned throughout the whole entire way, and he can't make any decisions. Uh, Yoko is attached at the hip to him. Say what George, you will. But George quits the band It's at one point. The George, so yes, the George stuff is important. I think that's where I kind of want to bring something in with with to tie it into Pearl Jam here. The George stuff with... He, he just wants to to put in his input. He he has songs that he wants to put out there. They got to put out a live show that they got to do, basically a live record of all new stuff that they got to do in two weeks. And George is like, I got all these songs. If We need songs, so I got all this. And and Paul's like, okay, and just does his own thing. He's like, Yeah, they Great, end up I'm... using like two of them or something, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and it's cool because you get to see – 
like the first edition of Isn't It a Pity and All Things Must Pass. All Things Must Pass. And then yeah. Give Me Some Truth as well Give gets the, yeah. the first. God, but, imagine if all those songs had been on Let It Be. That would have been incredible. Oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I am glad that Give Me Some Truth ended up being a John Lennon song. It just has a lot more bite as a Lennon than a Beatles song. It, if you listen to what they did with it, it has like that Beatles like ringing chord to it. And I'm like, uh, that, 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 that's the difference. That's the difference. But I like what, what Lennon did to it. And that's, that's obviously a Pearl Jam tie. But the, where I'm going with this is that when you think of, of Pearl Jam's history and you think of kind of the, some of the turbulence that they've been through, really the time is, is 1993 through 1995 is where all of that sort of came to a head. And I guess it's fantasy booking and it's fantasy thinking here, but if, any documentary would to come out that had footage of the band that would be most impressive that you'd want to see. I would think it would be the Vitalogy sessions. However, you made up a point before we went on the show is that the versus sessions would be uh, incredible to watch too, because that's seeing how Ed's character is unfolding. That might show a lot of people that don't understand Pearl Jam that don't understand Eddie Vedder to appreciate who Ed is. Vitalogy might piss a lot of people off if if you put that out there to to show the the end of the Dave Abrazes era and what was happening that Ed was taking over the band and and maybe not unlike how Paul McCartney did, but there's just a lot of stories that came from those sessions that yeah. would be interesting to see how they all unfolded if they were yeah. captured. Yeah, and the, and for me, like I'm I'm a junkie for music documentaries. Like that is my As favorite. I. That is yeah. my favorite genre of movie to watch. So yeah, this this get back Beatles thing is just yeah, it's it's nine hours. Like give it to me full on. Uh, I'm in. And the the thing that jumped out at me the most is like you're just getting to see the creative process, and like I, that's what I remember about being in a band is like that's what I miss the most is like, you're creating something. And like, it's that moment when you hit on something that you know is good. And like, for me, it was on a very, very small scale. Like, you know, for us, it was not nearly at, at the level of the Beatles, obviously, but just to watch them work this stuff out live and just to see how that, how it was all put together. Like, Oh, I, I just transfixed by it. And yeah, like vitality for me is, I think not, as exciting as something like Versus would be, or even something like No Code, where they're just trying to kind of reinvent themselves and trying something new. See, I think No Code would be too much like how Yield was. I don't know. Maybe. And maybe um, maybe not in the standpoint of just the band is, is feeling happy, because yeah. I don't think that yeah. there was a lot of happiness during No Code. Uh, but it would be a totally epic three-part documentary yeah. series yeah. if you got versus then Vitalogy, then No Code to see how that all... Because I think you, you just need to tell the story with yeah. Jack's arrival to the band. And, mm -hmm. and it's just kind of a triumphant end of that era, so to yeah. speak. And I, mean, I think you, you that, could, that all needs to be told. You could make a case for each one, like for versus, like, yeah, I want to see Dave recording that and being all pissed throwing off the, and throwing the his sticks at drum the wall. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to watch them, you know, record in difference, you know, live. I want to hear them, you know, go through go and animal in the studio and for vitology. Like, yeah, I want to, I, I would, I I would want to see, see I would want to see the band react when Ed leaves for four days. Yeah. Yeah. What are they, and like, what are they going to do? Right. And for vitology? Yeah. I want to, I want to see Jack come in and do stupid mop. Like people might not love that song, but I, I want to see that. Like I want to see him break out, find that accordion, and do bugs. Like I want, I want to see the conversation yeah. that he had with Brendan O'Brien about Better Man. Better Man, that's absolutely. That's the one from that. Yeah. That and yeah. uh, the whole Pete Townsend guitar situation thing. That I'm sure, uh, however it would play out, it would play out. But yeah. I, you know, yeah. there's there's been stories to be told about that. But yeah, I, I think if if there were any sort of get back type moments in Pearl Jam's history to do. Personally, I think Vitalogy would be the center well, of, for the of for the fiftieth anniversary in twenty forty four, we can only hope. <laughs> yeah, right. We, got, we still got twenty three more years. You never know what this band has in their vault. That's they, true. They That's they true. pull stuff out all the time. So you just never know. For I got a feeling you actually get we talked about this when Ed did his uh when he when Jeff had his moment and he talked about, you know, 
meeting Andy and all that stuff. And Jeff is actually the one, and I got a feeling who gets to sing that line. You know, he, he kind of does the everybody misses Andy and that whole like yeah. verse about singles. It's actually Jeff doing the singing on it instead of Ed because Ed's going off and doing something else. And like, can, can we move on from the Millie Vanilli line? Like, can we just go back to to singing it the Beatles way? Like, that's so dated now from from 1990, 1991. I guess, but I mean, they played it so few times that they they just don't know any other. They played yeah. it three times since that era, you know. Yeah, I know. So yeah. it's it, how else are they going to think about it? But yeah, I just uh, thought it was interesting that, that after after that it was it was Jeff who gets to, to sing the line about Andy. That was cool. Yeah, I th- I think if anybody deserved it, I think I think Jeff would be the one. But I mean, great great way great way to put that in. Great way to end the show. Rocking in the free world again. Stone annihilating the solo expected and Ed running around on stage tossing all the tambourines but before Led Better Ed thanks everybody businesses all big and small it took a lot of focus and effort and so much was done in a short time we could solve this issue together thanks for everything tonight it means so much to us we're proud to be part of whatever this is when we get together and Led Better is just a happy goodbye uh, you know Ed, Ed says well, I don't want to stay it's home donning a an old school mariner's helmet in this too like that was very cool mike gets a little teases and then kind of puts the brakes on a little bit but does the little wing part and uh that that gets you the tag and and any show that has a big bow at the end tells you how they feel feel about it and tells you yeah how much they respect the crowd and what they and- brought to the table yeah, and Ed even does like the little heart pouring out motion, like takes his hands from his heart and like pours them out, like you know, yep. thank you, just a way to say thank you. And like this show meant a lot to them for a lot of different reasons, and they they showed up. This is a fantastic night, great show. Yep. If you haven't come back and watched it in a while, like it's very much worth your time. I think you said it before. I think it unfortunately gets out overshadowed by night two. I think that's disappointing because this stands alone on its own. Night night two. While they go back to the discussion about the homelessness, this brings that story to life. Let's pick three moments that we like from it then. Oh, uh, can I pick thirty-two? Can I pick forty? Like, just well, I mean, you want to go back and listen to the episode again? Then I, uh, I guess, yeah, yeah, give me a few hours. No, for my three, it's uh, I'm going to start off with the way that Long Road just flows seamlessly into release. That was just powerful and very cool and something you don't you don't often get those two like we talked about maybe five times they've been played at the same show just unbelievable and just set the tone right from the beginning that this is going to be a special night my number two is we are going to be friends and the moment with ed's daughters coming on stage and just a really sweet moment felt like it was earned the teacher thing was really special and number one's obviously the even flow speech and the even flow performance just elevated the song to places i'd never thought it would go and all those other speeches of the night like the symmetry of like every band member getting their little moment and even flows the the best one and never thought we would get that story and that's that's my number one hands down yeah it's hard to disagree with any of those picks so i'm going to pick a couple others just to get them the notoriety because i really i loved everything that you just said there as well i'm going to put the uh emphasis on help into help help here i think it's just a song that just doesn't get a lot of attention and a lot of love and and although yeah it needed a little bit of beatles to be put in that position the song stands on its own it really does and it belongs as part of a more in sort of a way that I guess low light or a song like that kind of has like afterlife after the album came out. I think, I think this could be that kind of song help help. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put that combination in there. I would say the second just overall number two moment is all of the speeches about the band members, all that tied all the band members in with Seattle and everybody had a story to how they got there. And it really brought the whole night together and connected you with the band. And and you got to learn a lot about all of them, essentially. Maybe, maybe not Matt as much because Matt was really, that was a discussion about Randy Johnson more than, than Matt. But 
you got to get a sense of who who they were and and it's not all the time you know usually their shout shout outs are very simple it's just kind of a that's that's him over there that's him over there but you know they they talked at points like oh mike you you worked at a pizza place and and matt you worked at kinko so like that kind of stuff sticks with you and you remember those little things and especially if you're nerdy and and you like that shit that always stays with you so yeah all all the speeches about the guys themselves and then it's really hard not to make even flow your your top moment from this and especially the story going into even flow it's uh it's super important on a grander scale and it's kind of saying in 1990 1991 when the song was being developed that really they had an idea for what they wanted out of it and how they saw life in America and i think this is this song it should be seen more as that than it is and uh it's disappointing because a lot of people just see it as the grunge era kind of song but it's it's not you know it should be seen as one of those kind of american standard sort of songs that like a bob dylan would write or something like that i know it's not in that high standard but songs that define what is happening within your community so yeah that's where i stand with that okay uh let's rate this one this should be a really really good rating and i'm really interested to see what you have to say and I promise I won't base what I have to say off of what you have to say. So <laughs> go. Uh, 10 out of 10. Really? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think it's nine and a half. <laughs> okay. it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's a great show. It's a legendary show. I think I even gave night two a nine and a half. I didn't think night two was quite a 10 when we did that, but I also saw shows in a different light back then, but this was up there, but this was tough to give it a 10. Cause I just think of upper echelon type shows and maybe it's just kind of the, you know, seeing it from sort of the popular crowd and what you guys would think about this show. You know, you would see night two is the more superior one. And I always kind of did too. And I think that they have, their reasons. Both shows have their identities to why they should be very, very good. I don't know if I'm talking myself into a 10 here, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I am because I think it's just a really solid, awesome nine and a half, but probably one of, if not the best storytelling shows that they've ever put together. So I'll, I'll say that and, and uh, how that cannot be a 10 show is, is, is difficult and I can't quantify why I don't want to give it a 10, but I, I think of some of the other shows that we gave 10s to this year and I, I don't see this one as quite being in that category, but it's very, very high in the other category and probably to all the people that think Night 2 is better, maybe give this one another chance. So there we are. Okay. Let's tell them about what we're doing next week. Do you know what we're doing next week? I barely know what we're doing next week. Next week we are, we talked about going back to 2003. Next week we are going back to 2003. Indeed. We're doing another Michigan. We did a lot of Michigan shows this year. (laughs) I try to spread them out a little bit, but we had a a lot of Patreon requests from the, the state of Michigan that, Wolverines just beat the Buckeyes, which almost never happens. So that's that. That can that's be a right. shout out setting to up, you guys. Setting up for uh, for a showdown with uh, with my Georgia. There. That's right. Yeah, my you got a lot. You, you got a lot of fans of the show that are are currently at Michigan or are Michigan alumni that that will go toe to toe with you on that one. So no. that, that should be very interesting, very fun to see play out. But yeah, we're Clarkston from 2003. I think it's the night two show. And there's a story behind it. It was never put on the schedule and they had to reschedule it. But that story will be told not by us, but by our patron, Clay Davis, who will be on to talk about it. So we're excited to get him on. I don't think he's been on a show before. So that should be that should be great. And uh, yeah, that's 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 what we got from this one. And we're almost done with the year because we're in December. And, and uh, look, we will have. One more in the hometown series. I think we kind of alluded to it before, but there's one more show that's important to Seattle that we haven't gotten to. And and maybe scratch your head and try to think about it a little bit. 
and come back to us and think if you got it. If you got it, then if you can think about it, then send us an email, send us a message and say, this is what you're doing. And I'll tell you if you're, if you're right or not. If not, maybe we'll just, send you the bootleg if you're right. Oh, maybe they already have it. Maybe we'll send you another one then. <laughs> but yeah, that that's going to come a week afterwards. And then I'm not quite sure what, what we're going to do during the Christmas weeks. That's, that's being deliberated right now. And, and we might take, we might take two weeks off. We might do something a little bit lighter, but uh, we're just not sure yet. So this might be the penultimate, official show next week of 2021 but nothing set in stone just yet but but just know that that might be that so we're, we're excited to bring that one to you and uh, again anybody that wants to head over to patreon patreon.com slash eleven four legs and and check out all the content over there and help out the show please uh feel free to do so and also hey it's been a while since I mentioned something like this, but please subscribe. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on SoundCloud, wherever you do it. Because we've we've actually, all we've been doing in our social media promotions lately is we've been sharing the liveonfourlegs.com page that has the episode embedded into it. So we don't get to really talk about the bigger platforms, but it helps us and the notoriety on there just leave us a comment, especially on Apple. Leave us a five-star rating if you can. Let us know what you think. It's really important, and it'll get more people to get involved, and, and that's what this is all about. You heard us talk about it before. Five new patrons this week, which means people are continuing to get involved week after week. So, yeah, we just we just want to spread the word out more, and, and not because you know it's, it is what we're doing, but the whole premise is that there are a lot of memories out there that people want to relive and uh we're we're just trying to to put those in focus and give some of them their time in the spotlight so that's all we're trying to do and uh i think we did this one pretty well so let's say goodbye to the hometown just for a week and then we'll be right back i'll do my little spiel because i'm out of adjectives right now so i'll do my little spiel this is the end. We're here not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, I miss you already. John misses you always. We'll be back next week. Clarkston, Michigan, 2003. Right, Actera. But we don't miss the kingdom. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody in the building. Thanks for all the small businesses, the big businesses that all came together and all the volunteers. And uh, it, it, it just, it took just a bit of focused effort and so much was done in such a short time so um, we only think that we can just keep that moving and it would be so exciting to think that uh, we could solve this issue together uh, thank you for listening tonight thanks for coming thanks for all your energies tonight and over the years it means so much to us and we're so proud to be part of whatever this is that happens when we get together. Thanks so much.